29, Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 21. It says, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. Let me read that again. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. Lord, thank you that we can be together tonight. Thank you for the songs we've sung. Thank you for the time to pray. And uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege, Lord, you, you encourage uh, group people to pray. You said, if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they should ask, it would be done for them, Lord, of our Father, which is in heaven. Lord, there's something about united prayer that you um, you promise a special blessing to that. And God, we thank you, Lord, that we can do that. Lord, help us to cherish the privilege. Help us to realize the power of that privilege. Now, Lord, uh, help us again tonight, Lord, as we uh, continue I mean, that stream that we have been on. And Lord, we pray that you would make it, Lord, a blessing and that you would uh, make it all that you would have it to be. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, in Proverbs 29, verse 21, you have a very unlikely situation described. It says, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child. And he said, one day he'll become your son. That would, that would not have been a common occurrence. You know, you, uh, you had this guy and he was a servant and maybe, you know, uh, his, his wife was, uh, you know, you see this in the old Testament. Um, you know, his wife also was a servant and they had a child and that child would be brought up in your household and you would be the master. And the Lord said here through, through Solomon that if, if that master was very careful in how he brought up that servant, that, when his mom and dad were off the scene, that, that servant would actually be glad to become his son at the length. The key word in this verse is the word delicately. Verse 21, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child. And the word delicate, when you, you look up the word in the old dictionary, um, it, it, it means uh, very precisely. It, it means uh, religiously exact. It means very particular. That's the thought of delicately. You know, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're you know, covering this kid in cotton balls. That's, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about very delicately as, as if uh, you're being extremely careful, but very detailed. You know, you do that all the time. Um, we don't do it with our families most of the time, but we do. This is a way we live. For example, you ladies that cook and a lot of you guys are tremendous cooks. Um, you know what you do? You're you're usually pretty careful with the recipe. Well, it says a pinch of salt. You don't go, oh, a couple of tablespoons will be fine. It's just a little bit more. Yeah, this is baking powder. Oh, no, let's just let's just throw some garlic in there. No, you don't, you don't do that. You know why? You're you're very careful. Somebody hands you a recipe. How many times have you ladies had this experience? You know, you've got this amazing recipe, and it is amazing. Somebody eats your cookies, and they go, I want that recipe. And so you tell them. Now it says a cup of butter. Okay, now I'm going to make this up, okay, but you'll get the idea. Um, because I we, we've had this experience. And you look at them, and you say, now it's very important that you really use butter and not margarine. Um, you use the real thing because it's not going to turn out the same. And then they come back to you and they say, well, I made those cookies and man, they just weren't yours. And you found out they used margarine and uh, they used, um, you know, generic chocolate chips that were, you know, more of soybean oil than they were chocolate. And, 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 you know, you get all these things and, and they go, I don't know what happened. And you're going, I know what happened. You didn't 
meticulously follow the recipe. Um, that's the thought of delicately. Uh, your watch battery replacement. Um, uh, somebody's got my watch tonight. Um, I think Moses has, has it. Moses, where are you at? There you are. There it is. And uh, my last watch had, uh, you know, a battery. And, um, and I had one watch before that one that I, I didn't realize it, but I fried it. And how I did it was I was changing my own battery. Well, I've done that before. Well, I changed it and it never worked after that. And I took it to a, a, a jeweler and I said, well, actually it was a watch guy there in Hudson Bay that deals with, with watches and clocks. And I said, what's the problem with my, my watch? I said, I changed the battery and he's messing around with my watch. He said, oh, this, this watch is dead. He said, I bet I know what you did. He said, you went to change that battery and you use something metal to pop the battery out. He said, you can't do that. Because he said, if there's the least bit of a static charge, it destroys the mechanism. I thought, oh, is it that delicate? Delicate? You got the word? I was filling out some government forms here uh, when we lived in Saskatchewan. And, you know, when you're filling out these government forms, you know, at the end of the government form, you have to sign it. Well, there was this green, green box. And the instruction said, Sign here. And then it said, do not get any of your ink outside of the green box. They said, if you do, your application will be rejected. I thought, you got to be kidding me. Man, they wanted it done exact. Um, some of you guys, I don't know, we've got some hunters in here. And, um, you know, my son, Micah, he was a reloader. And, uh, uh, you know, we've had other guys that have messed around with reloading. And, you know, you got that, that bullet, you know, and when you, 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 when you reload it, you, uh, you save the casing and you, you have your own gunpowder. And there's interesting, a bunch of different kinds of gunpowder. And you get the right gunpowder for your, for your bullet and you, you measure it very carefully. And you measure it by grains. And, um, you know, there, there's not much latitude on how many grains. Now, you think about how much gunpowder is in that bullet. I mean, it's only this big... It's only this big around. And you think it says, I, I'm going to, again, I'm going to make this up, but if it says 45 grains of powder and you think, oh, I want my bullet to go extra fast. <laughs> I'm going to make it 75 grains. Now, first of all, I don't think you'd get 75 grains in that. But let's say you could. There is such a thing as hot loading a bullet, but even when you hot load it, you only add a few more grains. You don't add 20 or 30 more grains of powder. You add 20 or 30 more grains of powder and you're liable to have, you're liable to mess up your gun and possibly have an explosion in your face. You know why? It is to be delicately done. Uh, it's very specific. And I, I like the, the wording that showed up. It said religiously exact. And there's another word in the Bible that shows up in several places just look with me at Psalm 112, and I've got a whole list of, um, of this word. But it's the word discretion. Discretion. It carries a very similar thought. It, it, it's, it's the thought of doing things exactly as God intended. Discretion. Um, Psalm 112, verse 5. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He, a good man, will guide his affairs with discretion. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child. He said, here's this child. And God says, if you will do this religiously as exact as possible. God said, the harvest you will reap from that will bless your life. You, you know as well as I do that a lot of people's approach to Christianity is very general. And uh, if you ask them how they're doing spiritually, and if you could ask that without being intrusive and you could ask it with, and get an honest answer, they would say, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But specifically, how are you doing specifically? I got two friends that are far distant 
and um, they're saved and in good churches for years. And, um, and they would feel that they are above many. Now, you know what? Nobody admits that, but, but they really are. They're, they're what you might classify as really good Christians. You know, they're not doing anything, anything really wrong and they're faithful and all that stuff. Um, if you said, how are you doing? Oh, they'd say good spiritually. But if you knew them, they are in open violation of God's word in several specific places. Open violation. It would only be obvious if you knew the scriptures. But most of you know the scriptures. And if you knew them and you were looking down, are, are they nice people? Are they throwing money in the plate? Are they participating? Sure, sure, sure. But specifically, specifically, they are in open violation of the word of God on several counts. And they would look at you like you're from Mars if you if you even brought it up. But they also wouldn't deny it either. They're just content to be somewhat better than the rest. You know what? I, I, I want to share some things tonight and we're going to tread into some, um, um, some touchy territory just a little bit. And, uh, but what I want, I want you to do, number one, again, realize my only goal is to help. And my goal is to be scriptural tonight religiously exact you know a lot of christians you know their their fellowship with god isn't what it isn't what they want it to be and um and you know sooner or later down the road some things are going to surface in their families that are really not what they want either and and they just look they're just mystified but the problem was they were very general in their approach instead of as God is. Boy, I'm telling you what, man, you read this book. Wow. Is God ever exact? It really is. Now he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. And so uh, tonight, again, my goal is not to discourage anybody. My goal is not to hit any hot buttons, although we'll probably hit one or two. That's not my goal. My goal is to lift our eyes a little bit higher and to realize that God takes some things very seriously that most Christians in good churches in 2024, don't take very seriously. And how you know he takes them seriously is because he mentioned them. And a lot of these things you never hear mentioned in any pulpit anywhere. But God mentioned it. Look at Titus. Uh, go with me. Uh, go with me. First of all, Proverbs 31. And we're just going to, we're going to, um, we're going to hit a few verses and then we're going to get where we're going. So here's what I here's what I want to do tonight, and uh, I don't know if we'll get through all this, but I, I think we'll get through a lot of it tonight. And then uh, just just so you know, because instantly when I do this, there'll be a question that pops up in several people's mind. Um, so I'm just going to tell you where I'm going um, tonight. What I want to zero in on, you know, we've been talking about training and the little guys, and you know the the board of education and all that stuff. Um, we we've covered a lot of that, but but now where I want to go with this is um, your children as they're progressing, as they're getting older. And, and actually, it's still things you want to establish from the start. But really where I want to go tonight is some principles that you want to instill in young women. Okay, And following that will be some principles that we need to instill in our young men. So just, just so you know, you know, I'm going to hit this as fairly and as squarely as possible. All right, so let's look at Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. All right. Proverbs 31, verse 10. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And of course, what he's alluding to here is that this virtuous woman is difficult to find. Okay. Now, he reiterates that in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Go with me there. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Now, I think we've got them in our church here. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm not. But here's again, what I'm trying to establish with, with, with us tonight is um, we need to we need to be intentional about where we're going. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it. 
You've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional about our young men and our young women. We are not going to raise virtuous young women unless we have meticulously aimed at that. Will we fall short? God knows we fall short all over the map. But if we make that our goal, God will help us and he will he'll fill in our deficiencies if indeed we have made that our goal. Um, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 23. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 23. Solomon said, all this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even the, of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. So again, he's hinting at the fact that, um, you know, this, this woman that is um, exalted by the Holy Ghost in these passages, she is difficult to find. So with that thought in mind, go with me to Titus chapter 2. And, you know, there's so many angles to, um, you know, I mean, good grief. We could, we could talk about this and, and, and then we're going to hit the young men. And there's so many angles to so many things. And, of course, we're... We're not going to do that, but, but, you know, just like to highlight some things, just, just point to some things. Titus two starts off, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he begins to address the various genders and age groups. The aged men, verse 2, verse 3, the aged women. And at the end of verse 3, it says that they should be teachers of good things. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women. See, so these things need taught. They, they don't just, they don't, if you aim at nothing, you hit it. it it's by design, okay? That they may teach the young women to be sober to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. And notice the next phrase, keepers at home. You know, with this phrase, what, what a lot of people do is they immediately change the wording. You know, here at Capital City Baptist Church, and, and I think most of you guys are with me on this, we believe that the words of the King James Bible is every word, exactly every word as God intended it to be. And, and here's what people do. They, this, this thought intra, in, immediately introduces a contradiction to our culture. And so to accommodate that, they, they say, well, you know, it's, it's keeper of. But that's not what it says. At denotes location. To be discreet, chase keepers at home. Okay, so stay with me for a minute. Do not tune me out. Please hear me out. Um, you know, some women must work. And um, it falls their lot. It falls their lot. Sometimes it's due to their husband's death. Sometimes it's due to a divorce. Sometimes it's due to the fact that they, they never married and, um, you know, and their, their parents, you know, they're not with their parents anymore for various reasons and they must work. Um, some, their husband requires them to work. They really wouldn't work, but their husband has demanded that they work. And so they work. 
Some have never known anything else. That's just, that's what they've always done. Um, some do it because they're trying to maintain a, fin a financial status. And they can only do that if they both work. So, um, you know, I, I just want to start off and say this. You know, you always got to you always got to guard with some of these things that you don't become critical or pharisaical. There's many women who work in the secular workforce, Christians, Bible believers, who really wish they did not have to. And so, you know, you, you often do not know their circumstances, and it's not for us to know. You know, uh, you just have to take care of yourself. Um, but we need to let our daughters know that God's plan A is that they be a keeper at home. We need to train them. We need to prepare them for that. I'm not saying they're trapped in the house all the time, you know, and they're never allowed to go outside. And there's always extremists. Um, but the goal, the occupation, we need to train them. We need to instill in them to love the house. And, and, you know, there's women in our churches, you know, and, and it's just, it's our society. Um, they, uh, if, if they, you can hear it in their, in their voice and in their body language. Oh, I, I don't want to be stuck in the house. You know, there are some women that would die if they had to be a homemaker. And that is what we're talking about. Teach them. Teach them to be keepers at home, to love their children. The highest calling, oh, my soul. Uh, in, in, I, in Christianity in 2024, there are some uh, terrible things that are eroding and eating away at the presence of God and the work of God in our churches. And, you know, people get together and they pray, oh, God, you know, help us and and work in our lives and work in our church. And they're in open violation of the word of God. All over the place. And, and they, now hear me, because they, they choose to be. If they didn't choose that, hey, we understand. And God understands. I sat down with a couple um, a little while back. And we were just having a casual visit. And they said, Pastor, have you ever heard of, and they, they themselves are from a, a, uh, a different ethnic background. And they said to me, Pastor, have you ever heard of the toxic blank culture? And they named their culture. They said, Pastor, have you ever heard of that? I said, well, I haven't really heard it by that title. And they said, Pastor, they said, in our culture, even in the churches in this city that, you know, that are largely filled with our culture, he said, they said, if you go in there and you try to join that church and be a part of that church, it won't be long. And other women are going to come up and they're going to be asking you, uh, so what do, what do you do for a career? And, and what do you do? And if you can't give them an answer to that, if you're just a keeper at home, they just look down their nose like you're a loser. Every woman must work. Every woman must be a professional or have a career. In Baptist churches, and what they have done is they have taken the highest calling, which is being a wife and a mother, and they've stuck it down here. And anybody that follows the highest calling is a scumbag. Do you know why that is? Because back there somewhere, some missionaries went over there somewhere. They didn't give them the whole counsel of God. You got to start somewhere. You know, every culture has their things that are terribly wrong. My culture, the culture I grew up in, it was drunkards and whoremongers. And it's still drunkards and whoremongers. And, uh, you know, every culture has something wacko in there because it's a part of the fall. It's a part of just a sinful man. 
One, uh, one missionary was uh, at a certain place at a certain church. And, and uh, so she's a missionary. Okay. So her and her husband are sitting there and the pastor sitting there and they're all talking. And she began to talk about this particular garment that she would wear. And she knew that the pastor was going to disagree. So she said, now, pastor, she said, now you got to understand this is our culture over there. And he looked at her and he said, well, I hope God never sends you to a place where they go topless and wear grass skirts. Same logic. Same logic. See, we must train our, our young women that, you know, sure, life comes and, and, and life may throw them a curveball and it's, it doesn't mean they're wicked if they wind up out. It doesn't mean that. But what is their goal? What is their desire? What are they praying for? Oh, I'll, I'll have two babies and then I, I got I to gotta throw them in the daycare because I got to go back to work. Do you honestly, unless your husband forces you, do you honestly believe that is the will of God? Do you honestly believe that? You won't find that in this book. See, nobody, nobody says anything about that stuff. If you delicately, meticulously, religiously, yeah, this detail right here that nobody wants to look at. You say, what's wrong with North American Christianity? Oh, I can give you one great big glaring problem. It's one of them. We must teach our young women that the highest calling is to be a wife and a mother and that their goal and their delight and their prayer is that God will let them, if, if at all possible, God will let them be a keeper at home. Here's another one. Well, we need to teach our daughters something also on this line. And um, so before I start, uh, I, I want to ask you a question. So I want all group participation. You're, I don't think there's going to be a wrong answer on this one. Sometimes you think you know what people are going to say and somebody comes out with the wrong answer, you know. But I, I think we're safe on this one. Um, if, I, uh, if I wake up tomorrow morning bright and early and, um, and I'm, I don't feel good and I'm irritated, is it okay for me to curse and swear? Some of you had to think about this. these are not trick questions. Okay. So if I'm not feeling good and I'm irritated, does that make my swearing okay? It's still sin, right? Even though I wasn't feeling good. Hello? Is it okay to be hateful because I woke up in a bad mood? Now, you know, that's the right answer. Some of you are getting nervous. Is it okay to let angry jabs fly out of my mouth and to make everybody around me tiptoe just because that mood came over me again? And I'm tired and I'm not feeling kind and bubbly and spiritual. So is it okay to, is it okay to make everybody tiptoe around me? Come on, guys. All right. Have you ever read those amazing exception clauses in the Bible? You know, in insurance and legal contracts, there's always that fine print. So I want you to see one of the exception clauses. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse... Eight. Colossians 3, verse 8. It says, but now ye also put off all these. In other words, get this stuff away from you. Anger, wrath, malice. That's snarky revenge, malice. Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He said, get it away from you, get it out of your mouth. But now if any of you have a, a, a magnifying glass, if you, if you put it real close and lift it up, you know, about six inches off the page, you'll see a little exception clause. 
Uh, if you have a new version, it's probably in the new version. Uh, if you have a concordance, you might find it there. It says, this teaching does not apply when you are feeling especially short-tempered due to overtiredness, bad mood sensations, or having a headache, or when a major, major crisis occurs, such as getting your finger pinched in the closet door, or spilling ketchup on a nice white shirt, or an innocent child sneezing food into your face. Can you see it? Look real close. I'm sure you'll see it. Did you see it? It's right there. See the fine print? It's got to be there somewhere. Because I know a whole pile of Christians that they believe that. Nowhere in the Bible does sin fluctuate with the weather or with your gender or with your crisis or with how you feel physically. Now, the comforting thing is this applies to men and women. I know some men. Oh, there is nothing worse than a moody man. Oh. And just to comfort you ladies, I've never done this with a woman, but I did this with a young man. I took him out for coffee. <laughs> and I, I confronted him. I said, hey, dude, you're in your 20s. I said, there's nothing worse than a moody man. I said, you need to get over it. And I encouraged him. <laughs> Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3. My wife gave me something today, and I trust it'll be a blessing to you that it was to me. And uh, I think this is the motto of many people. And it says, my problem is I want to follow Jesus and slap people too. <laughs> I thought I told her, I said, I like that. Look, Genesis 3, verse 16. Galatians. Did I say Galatians? Yeah, I meant to say Genesis. <laughs> Sorry about that. Genesis 3, verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly. Boy, this is this is sad. OK, you know, let's read. I will greatly multiply thy. Sorrow. And. Thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You guys know this is one of the results of the fall. Um, you know, um, the woman is the weaker vessel, and that's true physically. It's few, it's it's true on a few fronts. Um, but you know, one thing about you know women and and them having children. Um, how many of you have seen the videos where they hook these electrodes up to guys and they try to simulate childbirth on a man? You may have seen that. It is worth the watch. It really is. I mean, those guys are squirming all over. It's just, and the ladies are dying laughing. Okay. You know what? My, my wife has said, and I don't know where she got it. It's a true statement. They said, if men had to have babies, there would be a great population reduction. <laughs> you know, there's something, you know, in some ways, you know, the, the women, uh, man, they got the, they, they have some difficult things in this. But in other ways, God gave them unusual strength. And um, but I want you to see, I want you to see verse 16. He says, I will greatly multiply thy great. Oh boy, this is this is hard. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. You know what sorrow is? Sorrow is, of course, it is a dark emotion. Um, a man generally will not have the emotional fluctuation of a woman. Generally, he will tend to be more level-headed and steady. And ladies, let me encourage you here, and you need to teach your daughters this. Do not expect your husband to be emotional like you. 
Do you understand it would be a nightmare if he was? God made a man so that you would have a rock to lean on and not a sponge. God intended that he would be a rock. A man's struggles will not be with sorrow. Now, oh, he'll struggle. He'll struggle with selfishness and a hundred other things. But he will generally not be weak there. You will. And God gave him to you. Don't, don't expect him to be like you. Oh, well, what's the matter with you? You're, you don't feel nothing. No, he... You'd be amazed what he feels. But, but you know what? He's, he's not going to fall apart. God made him to be your rock. Be thankful for that. Um, ladies, knowing that sickness... You, you need to teach your daughters... You, 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 you know, you know, we all know that it's really easy to, uh, you know, more, more is caught than taught. And, um, you know, what's, what's the big, what's the big joke? Uh, and it's, it's not really a joke, but it is a joke that, um, I'm trying to be discreet. But there's that time, you know, before everything kicks off every month and and the world has a name for that. It's three letters and you instantly, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And you know what that is? That becomes the world's way to justify pure, unadulterated, uncontrolled, unrestrained nastiness. You need to teach your daughters that that is unacceptable and it is not necessary. I, I didn't say they're going to feel cheery and smiley because they're not. That's okay. It's if, if you get the flu bug, it's okay to be sick. It's okay to wake up and you don't feel good. That's okay. But it's not okay to throw shrapnel and to make everybody tiptoe. Sin does not fluctuate with your physical condition. Knowing that, all of us know, all of us know, it is hard to be spiritual and to have a right outlook when you're not feeling well. If you guys can ever get a hold of any of the writings of Isabel Kuhn, the missionary to, to the Lysu, any of her books, you ought to read them. But she wrote about a period in her life where she became very terribly ill on the mission field. She was a zillion, a zillion miles from any sort of medical help anywhere. It was just the miracle of God she didn't die. And she said when she was in that condition, she was bedfast, and she and her husband was had to go far away to another mission station. And she said she learned something. She said, I learned that there was a definite connection between the condition of my body and my fellowship with the Lord. She said one seemed to affect the other. She said it was very difficult have we not all experienced this? It is very difficult to be spiritual when you're sick. Knowing that, knowing that, at the very least, you know, we must take care of ourselves. And that goes for all of you. We must. Lester Olaf said many years ago, it's a sin to be sick when you could have been well. In other words, you know, if you're sick, because, you know, for the last 10 days, you know, your diet has consisted of chocolate, donuts, and pop. Um, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're sick. Uh, you know, that's just downright sinful. You absolutely brought that on yourself. It was wrong. You were horribly indulgent. And you knew, you, you know, you weren't thinking about tomorrow. Um, you know, it's a sin to be sick when you could have been well. Why? Because sickness affects everything. It affects your energy level. It affects your irritation level. It affects your ability to endure. It affects your ability to interact with your husband, your kids, your the public, your, your wife. It affects your desire to serve, your ability to labor. It affects your mental outlook. The whole world becomes a burden. And what should be a challenge 
becomes a dread and a burden. Um, we need to teach our daughters that moodiness and sickness, it's very real. You know, we're not, we're not saying you teach them it doesn't exist. We're not saying you make fun of them. We're not saying you, you live in denial. No, we're not saying that. But we're, we're saying they must be taught that it is no excuse for sinful behavior. Most generally, the woman is the morale of the home. You say, you can't put that on me. Sure I can. Did you know even the world knows that? You know, the world has that famous saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. What's, what, what are they saying? You know, I, I could look at a man and I'm going to and I'm going to talk to the men and the men could say, well, pastor, you can't put all that stuff on me. I can't be responsible for the bills and the spiritual leadership and the discipline. Yeah, yeah, sure we can. Sure we can. Because that's what God gave to you. The children could rise up and say, you can't put that obedience on me. If you knew my mom and dad, what lunatics they are and how, you know, no, 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 no. We, it's, it's, it's there because, because God said it, because God said it. We're going to stop there. It's already 25 after eight. So, you know, in all these things that we're going to look at in all these things, you, you know what, again, tonight, all, here's all we're doing. We're just pointing to the goal. Um, we're pointing out some things that Christians in 2024, they just think the Bible doesn't have anything to say about it and they can do anything they want. But of course you can see that is not the case. Uh, we want God's blessing. Um, someday you're going to look at your daughter and, you know, she's not going to be perfect, just like just like you're not perfect, mom, dad. But you want to look at them and say, praise the Lord. I mean, she's got her problems, but she's doing good. You want you want her son, husband. You want your son in law to come up to you and say, dad, mom. Man, I sure appreciate what you did. And you can. But you must do it intentionally. Let's pray. Father, bless these simple truths. And uh, Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, uh, Lord, you are our help. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Lord, in all these things, Lord, help us now, Lord, where we are. Lord, wherever we are in life to see you as our help. Lord, I can do all things through Christ, Lord. Help us, Lord, in all these things. Lord, may we be more than conquerors through him that loved us. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for showing us the way. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.